Okay, for culture, um, I'm going to uh, do a number of things to overview what culture means. I'm going to talk about why it's important in humanitarian engineering. Shouldn't be surprising to you because you're going to other countries. Okay, but it's more than that because there's plenty of culture right in uh, Columbus, right? How many Somalis are in Columbus? 55,000. Okay, a lot. There's a lot of Hispanics in Columbus. Okay, so there's a lot of culture here, right in Columbus. Their culture, though, is is a concept. It's it's we'll define it more carefully in a minute because, in a certain sense, engineering has a culture, right? ECE has a culture. Civil engineering has a different culture, a lot different. Now, it, we're in, as engineers, we're pretty similar in our, the culture of engineering, but there's all kinds of different subcultures, okay? So we're gonna be talking about that, this role in humanitarian engineering. Then I'm gonna close out the lecture talking about roles in engineering, humanitarian engineering, like what role you wanna take um, and what type of roles are possible. Okay, so. What my fir the, the first two slides are to define um, the, the objective of the first part of the lecture. Um, and in particular, this is what I think of as a lot of people think of the world, right? When you think of the world, you sort of think of some kind of map like this. And you, know, you think of all these lines and divisions and you, you can you know, say, oh, there's Australia, whatever. Okay, you sort of think of the world from outer space in a sense, but you know, that's really not what the world looks like up close. So up close, it looks more like that. Okay. So what does this, what does this uh, photo or diagram mean? Well, it's uh, it, it's it's kind of unusual. I mean, you've got the Saharan Desert, so there's a camel. Well, there's an elephant. Oh, no, uh, it's hard to pick out something. There's a panda bear from the China, um, and. Uh, you know, there's probably, yeah, there's McDonald's right there, see it? <laughs> okay, so there's certain perceptions. Uh, and there's a teepee right here, okay? Um, and then, uh, I don't know, what's going on right around here in Latin America? I can't tell. Well, you get the point. I mean, but up close, the world is really colorful. And it, it's huge diversity, and it's fun in a lot of ways, okay? And... Uh, after you travel the world, this is, I think, uh, the way you see it much more than the previous slide. So, culture. Um, so here's a definition. I feel culture is so hard to define, I felt I had to put the def dictionary definition up. Um, so arts and manifestations of human intellectual achievement. So customs, arts, social institutions, achievements of a nation, people or social group. Attitudes and behavior <coughs> characteristics of a particular social group. So, like, wow, it's like everything. I mean, it, it is. It's like your whole. In, it's more. It is more than just people and their behaviors and what they, how they dress and behave and do all this and their attitudes, their opinions, their values. It's also the art hanging on the wall or the sculpture, you know. And, it's many, many things, and you, you, when you walk into another country, you experience this, and it's, it's like, holy cow, and, and, and you don't, you're taking all this in, and it's, it's confusing, okay? But one thing is important is if you learn about the culture before you go, it makes everything not only more understandable, you see more. You, you, you get so much more out of it. Before you travel, learn about the country, okay? Um, so, first issue when I read about cult, uh, for in cultural anthropology, there's the notion of ethnocentrism, which says a culture, let's say in the United States, we say we've got the best culture in the world. We stand behind it, everybody else stinks. Well, oh, you know, I thought this was just an American problem. And then you travel around and you start to wonder if the Indians have the same problem, or the Chinese, or the Colombians. And you know what? This book, the authorities in this field say that every culture's ethnocentric. Think they're the best. Wow. Okay, so it's not unusual. You shouldn't feel it's unusual, but you should realize that where you're going, I don't care how poor they are, I don't care, that, that's irrelevant. Their culture's number one. You have to respect it, okay? Um, so, cross-cultural humanitarian engineer. The first principle is you're an ambassador. 
Kai, of your country. You represent your country. You behave badly, it reflects badly on your country. You behave badly and you're part of OSU, it reflects poorly on the Buckeyes. On and on and on, okay? So you sort of have to think a little bit before you say certain things, before you act a certain way. And it, it is difficult to know what to say or behave like. Um, you're gonna be working with people, <coughs> excuse me, got a cold, from other countries. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's confusing. You're, you don't understand sort of what's going on. One of the first times I experienced this, I was with a, uh, in a Latin American country. And I'm just like, focused like a laser on getting the project done. And the person kept, keeps wanting to talk to get to know me, I'm like, this is touchy-feely, let's just get the project done. And I realized, you know what, I was all wrong. I was just absolutely wrong. Friendship matters more. In the end, it matters more. He was doing the right thing, not me. And after I realized that, after a day or so, you know, I chilled out too, and I had a lot more fun. I learned more about him, he learned more about me, we actually got the project done. And it's like, you know, and I'd heard this coming from other Americans. They're very, you know, I got a schedule and I got to keep it. I'm like a German. I've got time schedule. It's got to be kept right to the microsecond. And we got to get this much work done and all this. Nah, 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 nah. Everybody perceives time differently in the world. I mean, have you get to know somebody from another culture that doesn't, they come from a culture that doesn't respect time like your culture does? Wow. Uh, you know the concept of manana? It means tomorrow, but in some Latino cultures, it means, well, I don't know, within the next month. It depends on which country you're in. I have a Latino in the room. I think Latina in the room. Um, was there only one Latino in the room? Ah. So I'm going to start picking on people. Isa, tell me, in Colombia, if I say mañana, what does it really mean? Does it mean tomorrow? So, you might, now, for some of you, you're like, I'm pissed, I'm pissed, that makes no sense. They're disrespecting me, they're not trying to get anything done. That's your tradition. And one of my friends, he was saying that it's the first time that he was, like, celebrating, like, his birthday here. He said, like, okay, let's be at 10. I'm the only one that goes there at 10, so, like, the people can be, like, at 10. Exactly. Okay, so, look. You're trying to understand the people. You're trying, and you don't, look, it matters. These, these little things matter a lot because you don't want the, you don't want to get pissed off. I mean, it's no, that's just the, really the wrong reaction. And even though in the United States, it might make sense to get torqued and, you know, uh, you have to understand context, okay? Context is literally everything. The physical environment, the geography, the people, everything. We're gonna be talking a lot about context later on you are gonna help understand yourself because they're gonna ask you questions and you're gonna be like, gosh, I never thought of that, you know? Why do Americans like hamburgers? Um, next, client values, what do they want? What's their opinions, their attitudes, their preferences, their pri priorities? Um, they're different than yours, they're different than what you're used to, and you know what, that really matters because they're the ones that are the users of the technology. What they say dictates everything. If you can't come to understand why they would say something a certain way or why they value certain things a certain way, you're not going to do a good technology design, period. Okay? <laughs> um, they define good, not you. So the other thing is, is you don't want to be offensive or impose your views on people. So over the years, I, I, sometimes I, when I'm uh, really get to know another person in another country and, and it, over a number of years and talk, talk, talk. I sort of feel like, I usually conclude, well, we're, we're basically the same. You know, I feel a real close connection like I would with any American or anybody. But in other ways, though, we're different. I mean, we're just different. They'll say surprising things. So are we both? I think we're both. I think we're all the same and we're all different. Okay, every individual's different. You know, you can meet you can meet happy, fun people from any culture. You can meet angry, sad people from any culture, and that's okay. 
I mean, people are just simply different. All right, communication, up close talking. So you want to start talking to people. You want to talk to people directly at their eye level. You know, you're not going to look, you know, like this, like this, okay? And, uh, you know, almost everybody in the world starts with the weather. And, and, and basically, I have never heard anyone from anywhere in the world not say, well, basically, you know, if you don't like the weather here today, just wait till tomorrow. And they think that's really innovative. It's, it's hilarious. Everybody seems to say that. Um, but they talk about a variety of things in weather. Um, you know, you talk about your travel. Food's a great topic of conversation. Learning about their food, um, trying their national dish, learning about their drink, um, know their news before you go. Um, current events, so you can talk about those if, if it's appropriate, um, knowing their history or literature. I mean, I've never met, for instance, a Colombian who hasn't read, read uh, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Nobel Prize winner. So you have to know certain things when you're going to a country, okay? So in conversation, there are cultural differences in religion, morals, values, attitudes, opinions, all this stuff. And all this opposite sex stuff is a big issue in a lot of countries. A lot of, a, a lot of countries are male dominated. There's certain things you can and cannot say um, uh, in mixed company. And uh, you, you, you really have to be careful when it think, th th with things like that. There's also the customs problem of the kiss, bow, or shake issue. Um, so in, in, uh, I was in Colombia this summer with my son and daughter. And uh, he used to really bothered my son because she was, uh, I'm not gonna do it right here, but you know, in Colombia, when you, when you agree, you, you touch cheeks and kiss on both sides. One side, one side, I'm sorry. Gosh, I get the countries mixed up. One side, so, you know, I'm thinking, I don't think any of it. We're leaving Medellin and my son Jake says, Dad, we can see any of your women or girls on this trip. Just, oh God. Because I hate that Colombian smoochy thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, everybody, you want to do the right thing, right? I mean, um, then there's the what you do not discuss. Now, in the United States, over in a private, in a polite conversation, there's a list of topics you don't discuss. Americans, what are they? Politics. Religion. Money. Money. Now, Somebody from another culture? Would you add anything else to that? There's another one. Sex. sex. See, in the United States, you talk about sex like anything that can be said anytime with anybody. No, I'm kidding. But it, it has changed a lot. You're, we're almost there, okay? But a lot of other countries, you're not going there. You're simply not going there, okay? So there may be other things too, like, um, <coughs> I think it's good if I use myself as an illustration as in El Salvador a couple summers ago. Had a lot of long conversations about politics and religion and things you shouldn't talk about. You get to know people better, you can do it. And uh, I was in the Spanish and that was hard, that's hard for me. But, um, so we're, t and uh, so I, I got to the war. I mean, that's very important in their country. And, uh, you know, the fact that the U.S. was supporting um, the conservative right to, you know, against the left, and we're at the university that was invaded by the conservatives, and a bunch of students, university students, were killed with U.S. weapons. <laughs> so this is a very uncomfortable thing to discuss. So we discussed it, and the guys kind of, he was an old gentleman, he says, look, Kevin, that's all forgotten. Change the subject. Wow. Okay. Imagine, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty profound statement on his part, really. Okay, so... Um, I didn't tell Isa I was going to do this, but here we go.
This was interesting. There's a thief in your midst. <laughs> this is the best one, though. Okay, so so Felipe, my PhD student, um, get, sent that to me, and he uh, he said he, he demoed it for the class last year, and uh, and um, he said, "Is the lip point really true?" Shocking! It's amazing. It's like the most, common. most common, and and last summer when I was in Colombia, <laughs> you know, I was in three different cities, and I, I was so tempted to do it and just see if they would think nothing of it and just pass me the salt. So the typical thing: you're sitting at dinner, you want salt, you go. Right? I just couldn't do it, though. <laughs> but, um, so look, uh, if some, you say, what does it matter? What, is this just funny? Well, it does matter. If I'm sitting crossways with Isa and she starts going like this to me, <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm wondering, you know? So you see how subtle cultural things matter. I mean, there can be all kinds of like implications, okay? So, how are we viewed as US? Now, this is my compilation and summary over the years of what I've heard from people from around the world. Um, naive, the negative stuff and the positive stuff. Naive, arrogant, greedy, bad behavior, don't care about the environment, CIA military kind of dominance, very patriotic, poor morals, or promiscuous. I'll never forget. Uh, I want to say this carefully because a certain uh, international person, not from the U.S., told me, he said, trust me, Kevin, Americans are promiscuous. Trust me. <laughs> I was like, um, on the positive side, some, some sh shocks of people. People in the U.S. help more in that at home, help each other. Um, the system is efficient. Things are easy to do, okay? We treat disabled people with respect. In, in my country, that person would be in the gutter, dirty, and would have nothing because they had bum legs or something, whatever it is, okay? It's safe here. I've heard that from quite a few people. Um, people are open-minded, okay? So we have certain things um, that are positive and negative views both ways. Um, and you need to know about such things like this because it impacts, the perceptions impact, because you're, you're going into a country, you're gonna work with a group of people and they have an opinion of you based on what? Like hearsay, maybe the news, and everything, almost everything in the news is negative, right? I mean, everything, right? And so, you know, I can't tell you how many European friends um, have had to say, you know, things about our guns issue here. Wow. Or, or over Thanksgiving break, I have a friend from Canada. Her, her two relatives would not come visit her in Columbus because they're worried about getting shot. These are full-grown, rational, intelligent people. But they hear all this stuff in the news, it seems like the 320 million people are always shooting each other rather than, you know, so, so realize there's a lot of misperceptions and, uh, and uh, of you and of them. I mean, it, it's not fair to your culture or your country. It's not fair to their culture too. I mean, it, I don't wanna pick on a, I mean, India is a lot more than curry, right? You got Vindaloo. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But you, you get my point, there's, there's a lot more, everything's got good and bad, and uh, it's good to know that. So what I do not understand about other cultures, continue to pick on Isa, why don't Colombians wear short pants? And you know, I've asked, I observed this years ago, and I asked many Colombians, just for kicks, I ask them every time, act stupid. And you know what, At over half of Colombians God, you know, you're right. It is in the tropics here, and we're, we never wear short pants. I have no idea. <laughs> right? And then others get analytical and say, well, actually, when you're exercising, 
or you're on the beach, you're worshiping. But, I mean, come on. I can't worship your parents in Colombia. No way. I mean, you would be looking at a complete dork, wouldn't I? If I wore short pants to Cabo. No, but like most of the people wouldn't do it. They won't do it, yeah. So this is this is a, a it's a type of formality in the culture. Okay. Colombians tend to wear dark clothes too. Isa, what are you wearing? So there you go. <laughs> we didn't plan this out either, okay? Um, why are others so formal or respectful? Wow, there, from my perspective, I get this. I mean, in, in student, with, among students, um, Americans generally uh, don't respect the professor until, unless they really, really earn it. <laughs> you know, whereas in other cultures, they're nice to you even though, or respectful to you even though you don't deserve it. You know, um, so there's, there's a huge um, difference um, in this. Americans are often proud of not respecting authority. Um, I've heard Chinese, for instance, be shocked by that attitude. Like, what? So, so there's, there's some big differences along those things. Anybody else want to comment your experiences about this cultural? I don't want to put it. It's hard because I don't like to put people on the spot. Yes. Oh, I did. <laughs> I can't do it. Like, my parents are really uh, good, but I'll try it. So I've had Indian students over the years, and this is driving me crazy. Sri Ram Ganapati walks in my office, I'm explaining, do this, this, and this in your research. And he's going, okay, yeah, I'll do that. It's a waggle. It's a, it, it's, it's like a yes okay. and a no. Well, but it's, it's a no. It, the <laughs> Indian interpreter is a no. I, okay, all right. But I mean, you, when, you know, any American will interpret as a no. I, I was professors joke about this. I had my Indian student tell me he wouldn't do anything I would tell him. You know, but, but it, it's just a cultural thing. And he never changed. I told him right away, and then he couldn't change. He says, I'm sorry, I can't change yeah, that. Yeah, because like in, in India, it's, not, it's like an I understand. It's like, okay, exactly. I, I comprehend what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. That's a yes. You're fine. I'm with you. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yes. There's some, uh, I think it's usually Asian cultures uh, where they will slurp their food or their soup. <laughs> and, you know, in America, we're kind of like, that's disgusting. You know, close your mouth. What are you doing? But for them, it's actually, if it doesn't taste good, they won't do that. Yeah. Where it, that's like how they're showing that it tastes good. Or so I've heard. I, this is what I've been told. Yeah, some of the yeah. stuff is confusing. Others, yes. The number two or peace sign. Oh, Not go ahead. this way. This is vulgar, and this is normal. Uh, I learned the hard way. You learned the hard <laughs> way. Okay, uh, it's 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 tough. I mean, sometimes what you can do is is in these situations, you see something that's unusual for you, you can ask. But sometimes you feel really dumb, and you don't want to ask. So it's 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 difficult. I tend to be pretty stupid, and I just ask. I don't care. And and it's funny because usually people laugh like, wait a minute. Oh, you don't understand. And they very, people are very kind, and they'll explain to you, you know, why they're saying, will you explain? <laughs> you know, you're going to, people will explain. They, they, they're, people are very happy to do that, okay? Um, talking about difficult issues. So you got to be careful, ask questions. What I've found is, is I like to discuss problems of my own country. And what always happens is, is they say, you think that's bad? And then they go into their own country, okay? Like, like in El Salvador, you know, I'm a devious guy, so I, I'm talking about problems in the U.S. Boom, they're right, in, uh, you know, on El Salvador. I'm learning a ton from them because they're really opening it up in a non-offensive way, uh, too. It, wor it kind of works. Uh, I love this little cartoon. So the French guy, little fat French guy in a striped shirt, you know, classic view, drinking a glass of wine. The American, this is how Europe view, views us, with the ready to pull your gun, you know, the cowboy out in the Wild West. And we're arguing about the metric system. Feet, feet, feet. And then this guy is, is raising his volume. And this guy's saying, meters, meters, meters. 
But of course, guy in the right's right, right? I mean, five percent, four and a half percent of the world uses feet. Four and a half percent. Everybody else in the world uses meters, and they call it culture clocks. Okay. So, um, but anyway, the uh, socioeconomic class. This is a difficult one. On um, it is likely, if you do a humanitarian engineering trip to, let's say, Honduras, that you're going to be coming from a different socioeconomic class than the person you're going to work with. Okay? And it's not just that there's a cultural difference, there's a class difference. And class differences create big barriers, too, in talking, depending on how you do it. You know, like, let's not go talk about, you know, our yacht, painting our yacht or something. I mean, you need to talk to people at their level about relevant topics. So generally the way to think of this, um, lower class, if you will, tend to be more pragmatic, concrete, down to earth, less optimistic, less arrogant, and more religious. Whereas upper class tend to be more optimistic, idealistic. They tend to brag or have a hidden agenda or not, they're not like straightforward. Sometimes they're more arrogant or more secular. Um, Cross-class conversations can be difficult, and it doesn't, that can be within your own culture, of course, okay? Can the rich communicate, or communicate with the poor and vice versa? I mean, can it really happen? What, can we understand each other? It's difficult, okay? It's like a different culture, okay? It's a culture of class. It's, it's, it's different. It's just like, think of it this way. Ladies and men, don't, do men have difficulty communicating with women? I start trouble. Valerie. Okay. Um, so my boss is male, and we frequently have miscommunication with him, actually. We group, and sometimes um, say to the whiteboard to draw pictures so that we're both on the same page. Challenging. Yes. Would it be easy if your boss was a woman? I am terrified <laughs> of my female boss, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but look, I mean, they don't write books like men are from Mars and women are from Venus for an accident. That's not an accident. It's difficult to communicate across gender. It's difficult across culture, across class. It's hard. I think the important thing here is, is just recognize it's hard and, and, you know, try to be sensitive, careful, and work at it. And it works good, okay, in the end. So then there's the extremism cases um, that you have to be alerted that you might not have run into in your life yet, but you know, there's, there's problems even within, between an engineering group that goes on a trip, and then there are people you're visiting, and then there's all these kind of, sometimes there's some really strong attitudes that create problems. Somebody that's extremely conservative or extremely liberal, for instance, somebody that's extremely religious or extremely secular, don't think, you know, humanitarian engineering is all religious people. I mean, I, I, two good friends do a lot of humanitarian engineering. They're atheists. I mean, I, I don't, so you're going to find it all over. Then there's some people who have this attitude of charity, let's just go give things away, okay, or maybe subsidy, or then there's other people that say the best way to help the poor is to make money off the poor. Let's make profits, okay? We're going to talk about that later in class. And then there's sort of, some people have this view of being coercive, invasive methods to force people to fix their problems, or you support internal efforts. Or you ignore them. I heard someone years ago say, oh, look, the poor will always be with us. Don't worry about them. And you know where that quote came from. Somebody does. The poor will always be with us. Who said it? All right, we'll figure it out later. Um, Overtension to one level. Like some people focus on a single person a community, a region, a country, economics, politics, the world, and think they're solving the whole problem, okay? And it's really inaccurate. Um, then there's all kinds of biases, you know, like, I'm not unreasonable, it's them that are unreasonable, okay? Um, oh, and this one I've heard a number of times, it's really irritating. This technology can solve all the problems everywhere. This is, this is it, man. I got it. I did it. Our team did it, you know. Or um, this approach, in other words, this methodology will end poverty soon. 
a number of the books I'm going to talk about later in class, the authors just seem so enthusiastic, they can't avoid saying it somewhere in a book, one sentence. Certainly poverty won, so. Prahalad's book, for instance. Jeff Sachs' book, okay? So it's amazing. I, I think there's a lot of optimism, but then there's this over-pessimism. People just say to you, you tell them what you're doing in humanitarian engineering, you say, so what? That's not gonna do anything. They haven't th thought about the concept from Chris and Zach. A partial solution matters, even for a couple of people, okay? Um, and then sometimes there's an obsession <coughs> with a single issue. You know, they pick something like the environment and, and won't consider the importance of trade-offs with respect to it, okay? Um, now, that was my attempt, and, and it's difficult to, to talk about culture kind of up close. Okay. Now I want to step back and look at the big picture on culture. There's a fascinating website. Um, I'll be asking you to go to it. Um, the World Value Survey. They've surveyed around uh, uh, questions on, oh, there's, there's literally hundreds of questions. They've surveyed uh, around 250,000 people in the world to date in the country shown in the red on the bottom right. Um, and there's the, the data that they gathered. Um, and they created this map. Now this map is uh, at the website under a, a booklet. It's, it's also posted on my website. This is a fascinating map, so let, let me explain. On the horizontal axis, um, survival values are on the left. That means you know, it's very important that I just get my next meal. On the right, self-expression values means I get to paint art and vote in a democracy and you know, freedom of speech and all this. Okay, that's, that's a scale. And then on the, the vertical, I've got traditional values on the bottom. That could be a faith, a religion, a philosophy, traditional one. And then all the way up is secular, rational values. Um, you might be offended by the implication that traditional is not rational by their scale, but nonetheless. Um, now, and then they, they have a map. Now the map here, of course, is not a spatial map in the sense of land, it's a, it's a map in the sense of your position on those two axes. Okay, so everybody I hope is look, let's see, where, where is the United States? English speaking blob, green on the right. High in self-expression, okay, a bit traditional, okay. Who's near us? Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, Ireland. Now, pick another country and see where we stand. Okay, well, let's look around a little bit. Protestant Europe, up above. So, less religious than the United States. Everybody knows that, okay? And Latin America, below us. More traditional, more religious, <coughs> less self-expressive, okay? And then... <coughs> you have Africa down there trying to survive, very traditional, okay? Um, you can see the rest of them. I mean, you know, you've got, they're splitting Catholic and Protestant Europe, the ex-communists, etc. cetera. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think in some ways the map makes sense to me from what I understand of being around the world. I mean, I'm sure... It's based on a lot of data, so these are big time averages, you know. It sort of gives you a sense of what to expect. So let's say I'm in the United States and uh, I'm going to travel, let's pick on Colombia. Well, I expect them they're more traditional, maybe more religious. Um, they don't have as much uh, democracy, maybe they, you know, okay. It doesn't mean they don't have art. I mean, they have, Colombia has fantastic art, okay. But it means, you know, there's, there's, there's differences. I mean, it's a, this is probably being out here means that they wear dark clothes and no short pants. Geese is laughing. Uh, so look, I mean, it doesn't tell you that much, but it gives you a frame of mind to compare. Um, so, obviously, I'm going to put you on the spot. Where's India? Just below Poland. Just below Poland. Close to Catholic Europe. Weird. They're not. What do you think? Does this have any accuracy? A little bit traditional. It's kind of the left. What do you think? Is this in relation to other countries? 
almost at the same level, in fact, it was a tradition, traditional level in the US, almost identical to this one. It's this way it changed. I, I thought it should be more traditional rather than, I mean, I don't think that's a negative part of it. You, think, you, you I, would think it would I have been agree. down. Yes. I see. Down near Bangladesh? Mm, maybe near Turkey. Here? Yes. Okay. I mean, I don't know. This is just the survey. I have to look at the specific data they got from your country and where it was gathered. It, it depends on what people they surveyed for this particular thing. Maybe they just surveyed the people who are not really traditional. I mean, if you survey in the cities and if you survey in the villages. Yeah, it makes a big difference. difference. Yes? I think it does imply that. Yeah, it seems like you could replace that scale on the bottom with HDI. That would be interesting. Yeah, I agree. It would be interesting. And you can get all the data and go do it. Good idea. No, you can. You can download all this data. Okay. Um, next, let's look at more data of the big picture. Next one, interpersonal trust. You're going to a country... Are you going to be able to walk in? Are they going to trust you? Are they going to think you're just a greedy American trying to make money off them? I've had that happen to me. They, th I was trying to form a partnership, and they thought I was trying to get them to do work for me so I could make money. Seriously. Okay? They didn't trust me. Wow. It was like, I was, like, shocked, you know? Okay, yeah, well, let's talk about it. Um, so who trusts each other? Okay? Um, you can see the scale here is the light blue, dark blue, or more trusting societies into the red and the dark red. So you've got, um, for instance, Brazil not being very trusting, certain parts of Indonesia, you know, US kind of, uh, um, you know, more towards trusting, but not as much as Norway sitting up there. I think you probably look at some correlations with wealth here too. Um, you have uh, Latin America kind of like Siberia, Russia. Um, next, happiness. So it, the less happy is the red, the more happy is the green. Okay? So the U.S. is happy. Canada is happy. Brazil is happy. They're, you know, having carnival. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then you have uh, a lot of other happy places. Maybe there's a correlation here with uh, wealth, but maybe not. I mean, you know, you got some African countries there that are quite happy. Okay? World Giving Index. So this is a fascinating, if you get a chance, look at the, 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 the report that's at the website. Um, the World Giving Index is, so the question is, have you done any of the following in the past month? Donated money to a charity, volunteered your time to an organization, helped a stranger or someone you didn't know who needed help? Okay, and they compile percentages from countries all over the world. Who's number one in the world on their ranking? Take a guess. Yeah. Shocking. It's the U.S. in 2013. It's the United States. I was, I was surprised by this. Okay? How many times have I been told that you greedy Americans, you greedy capitalists, that's usually what they say. Um, and then Canada, Myanmar, you can read the list. I mean, there's a whole range. Um, so we were ranked um, uh, number one in that. Um, I found number two, though, more fascinating. I was a lot more interested in this. It said the global youth are driving the increase in volunteering, driving the growth of humanitarian engineering. We know that. I mean, that's how we're seeing that in the last 10 years in OSU. Okay, I'm going to skip over the data at the bottom. <coughs> and in culture, really this is what I would say. Come to a point where you can sort of see, tolerate, and respect the differences and think it's fun. It, it is fun. I mean, um, you know, it shouldn't be that like, oh, they're different than me. That's weird, or that stinks, or I don't like you. It should be like, oh, that's cool. I mean, and uh, it's a lot more fun if you take that kind of an attitude. Um, discussion. Anybody willing to say why are you interested in being a humanitarian engineer? Anybody?
We need some music. <laughs> I was at me, it was partially uh, kind of a lack of fulfillment in my previous job. Ah. Um, I just felt like I was working in the satellite industry, and there was so much, and it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to build a satellite, and it might all it be doing is you know, providing internet to Nebraska or something. And like $200 million could like fix that. I hear you. Yeah. Then similarly, in my previous job, it's all been defense. And, you know, everything I've worked on eventually helps kill people. And that kind of sucks. <laughs> you don't want to spend your life trying to make sure we can kill babies more effectively? No. I hear you. But that's a complicated subject. Don't, don't think that that comment. I don't like making a comment like that because it doesn't respect the complexity of the situation. It is an extremely complex issue. Consider humanitarian intervention, peacekeeping, anti-terrorism. It is a complicated topic. I discussed this last year in this class, and I pulled it out this year. Uh, it's, I would like to do that on a Friday where we can have a private conversation. I've talked about this for many years with people because of my engineering ethics class. We do it every year. And yeah, I've read about it quite a bit. Anybody else? Here's, here, I asked that question, a talk I gave to humanitarian engineering scholars last semester. Aaron Treglia took the responses of why I want to be a humanitarian engineer, why I do not want to be a humanitarian engineer. Took them, separated them. He and a group typed them in, emailed them to me. I dumped them in Wordle, created word clouds. So a word cloud means it's gonna, it's gonna count the number of occurrences of a word, and it's gonna make that word bigger in the cloud if it's more frequent. So. And then what you do is you're supposed to look at the word cloud and create one sentence that represents how the group feels. This is why people want, this is 49 people, why they want to be a humanitarian engineer. It says, I want to help other people in the world, right? I mean, that's the summary. This is what I, that same thing I've heard for years. That's the number one reason. I simply want to help people, okay? Now, that's not actually as interesting as the second case. The second case says, why well, do not want to be a humanitarian engineer? Okay, so somebody, I don't want to read this to you. I want somebody else to read this to me. What does that say to you? More money. Exactly. Who said that? Yeah, I want lots of money, a lot. I want work where I'll make a lot of money. fair statement. So it, to me, that's a challenge. Are people going to come out of this program and be able to get a high paying job? Yes? It might be too simplistic of a view with the word cloud thing though. Because for example, if I had a response that said, I don't want to be a humanitarian engineer because I'm worried that I won't make enough money to support myself. I understand. But I've read all the responses too. Yeah. yeah, it works. <laughs> but I mean, it's a valid concern, right? I mean, it, it, does it reflect something about the student's values, or does it respect, represent the reality that we all have student loans, blah, 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 we need to pay a lot? I think it's a complicated issue. What we have to work on, it's part of OSU's job to make sure you can get a good job in this area. And that's something we keep, I'm keeping students asking, your last summer primary class is on this issue. Next, engineer's role. So let's say you want to go into this area. What could you do? Well, what technologies? Listen, every discipline can find a technology it fits. You don't need to change your discipline, okay? Um, what role? Are you going to work with people? There's some people that want to work with disabled persons and design special wheelchairs for their life. Fine, that's great. Work with single people. Or do you want to work with a community Okay, let's say 10 to 300 people. You wanna work with a region? Oh, I love Latinos, I'm only working in Latin America. Do I wanna work on economic, high level economic things or political things? You can work at all these levels, okay? Um, but you have to know something about all the different levels. That's what I'm gonna to try to do in this class is, is span the levels, okay? Um, at least to some extent. Next, there's a whole issue of, uh, are you gonna work on something to give away, charity, or subsidize, 
or cost recovery, or am I going to make money off poor people to help poor people? Okay? Um, and then you got to realize that that's like transfers from developed world to developing world. What about developing world to develop? There's a lot of that goes on, like loan interest, low cost commodities, okay? Brain drain. You know, you know how many fantastic brains the United States steals from all the world every year? Quite a few more sitting in this room, okay? Um, okay. Who besides uh, Issa and, I forgot your first name, can name the music? Besides you, I knew you knew. This is, this is Juanes. Uh, okay, so, um, I think there's another final concept I want to talk about, and that's the degree of humanitarian engineering. So that's sort of the extent to which you're engineering it work is humanitarian. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes people will say to you, let's say, I'm going to um, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I'm going to install a pump uh, for, for a village that doesn't have water or electricity or anything. And you, it's sort of like, and I'm going to live there for a year. It's like, wow. Okay. And then there's like a spectrum, you know, oh, I'm gonna go to Upper Arlington, Ohio, and there happens to be a STEM education problem. You see the difference? And so, I'm not saying what's good or bad to do. I think, but I think it's good to have a notion of continuum here, um, so you can discuss your work in context. There's nothing, not, not everybody has to work on the worst case, I, I believe, personally. It depends on your interest, your personal constraints, your financial constraints, you know, your expertise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, if you just happen to, I was talking to a professor here, new professor here recently, and I, when you're talking about various countries in the world he could start working with, and we're talking, 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 he's got a lot of experience in Africa, and I said, where's your heart at? Africa. So I go to Africa. So he's setting up a Tanzania trip. That's Michael Hagenberg over in Civil. Um, he's setting up a Tanzania relationship now. He's got a lot of past work in Tanzania. Okay, so you, you sort of, you, you go where your heart pulls you in a sense too. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay. With respect to uh, roles, I wanted you to just think broadly that it's, it, there's many, many roles. You should not think that the trip you take to Honduras, that is what humanitarian engineering is and only is, right? It could be many other things, many other countries. It could be um, you're sitting back in a, an armchair and a desk far away. You can do useful things, okay? So don't view it, view this as a, a narrow field. It's, it's, I think, quite broad. I think we need more um, humanitarian engineers or engineers, period, at the table, at the World Bank, at the UN. I mean, how often do technology decisions, how often are technology type decisions being made, for instance, in this country by the US Congress? Go look up how many engineers or anybody that knows anything about technology is in the US Congress. Look at their background. Almost all of them are lawyers. What? I'm sorry, they don't know this stuff. So we need to place people that understand these things in the right places, all the way up. World Bank, UN, the whole, whole thing, okay? And, and I think people can have any of those roles. Okay, if you, any of your groups wanna chat after class, let me know.